Today at the National Press Club, the ambassador of Japan to Australia, Yamagami Shingo. Ambassador Yamagami's career has taken him to Washington, Hong Kong, London and now Canberra. He'll discuss the future of Japanese-Australian relations. Ambassador Yamagami Shingo with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra for today's Westpac Address. I'm the club's president, Laura Tingle. As you've heard, we're going to hear today from the ambassador of Japan to Australia, His Excellency Yamagami Shingo. Uh, ambassador Yamagami has had a range of postings around the world, including in the United Kingdom, the permanent mission to the United Nations, Hong Kong and in the USA. Uh, and uh, he studied uh, in, both, in both Tokyo and at Columbia University. Uh, it's obviously an interesting time for uh, Australia-Japan relations, um, not just because the softball match is opening up the Olympics as we speak and Japan's currently winning on current form. So um, I just thought I should bring it. Yeah. No need to apologise. No need to apologise. Um, without further ado, though, uh, could you all please welcome the ambassador? Well, thank you. Thank you, Lola, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I see some uh, familiar faces, uh, distinguished guests. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. One of the great joys of being an ambassador is the opportunity to meet face to face with people from all walks of life. COVID-19 has made this challenging. But Australia's success in containing the virus has made it stand out in the international community. And so in the months that followed my arrival late last year, I had the fortune of meeting people in each state and territory. In the words of a great Aussie tune, I've been everywhere, man. <laughs> Today, we gather on the traditional lands of the Nanawao people. One of my fondest memory was in the Riverland in South Australia. There, my wife and I were gifted this this beautiful handmade bracelet made by good author artist named Miss Ina Turner. The intricate bees depict the Japanese flag. I carry out this today out of my respect to the traditional guardians of this beautiful country. Another great joy is the opportunity to get to know a nation through film and literature. Recommendations from my Aussie friends have enriched my spare time. From a wasteland in Mad Max <laughs> to a nation of suburban butlers in the castle, <laughs> Australia has certainly many faces. My recent favorite is the penguin bloom, penguin bloom. This true history of a resilient Aussie family reduced my terror of magpies. <laughs> I won't say I'm cured. <laughs> In just two days, people will gather around screens to watch the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympics. Like film and literature, sport can transcend borders and build bridges. There is no denying these Olympics are being held under tremendous difficulties. Tremendous difficulties. But a safe and secure games will be a symbol of global unity in overcoming the pandemic. Australia has been a true mate to Japan in the lead up to this. I was very touched by Prime Minister Scott Morrison and opposition leader Anthony Albanese's words of encouragement in Parliament. Another encouragement came from the Australian softball team. 
these two blue embodiments of the Aussie spirit were the first team to arrive in Japan. Just a few hours ago, they faced off against the Japanese softball team, Soft Japan, in the much anticipated opening game of the Olympics. I'm just happy to report that Soft Japan has proven that they are not so soft at all. <laughs> The game took place in Fukushima, a community that went through adversity beyond description. 10 years ago, Japan faced one of its darkest hours, earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear accident. Here again, Australia proved itself a true mate to Japan. The Royal Australian Air Force Transport Trans Air Force transported food, water, personnel, and supplies to areas in need. Then Prime Minister Julia Gillard, she crossed oceans to visit the hardest hit regions and talk with survivors. For this, she will receive Japan's highest honor, the Grand Cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun later this year. Japan has endeavored at every opportunity to return Australia's friendship. During the Black Summer bushfires, two Japanese self-defense force aircraft were dispatched to assist with the disaster response. It was the first time that the JSDF had responded to bushfires abroad. Now, lest anybody th should think ambassadors just watch movies and sport. <laughs> I'd like to turn to the main topic for today. I want to ask us to think about how far Japan and Australia have come. I wanna, then I'd like to open up a discussion about what could come next. I want to turn the focus onto our ties in 15 years' time, and in doing so, I'd like to consider some of the most, most pressing questions. How can we maintain our mutual prosperity? How can we ensure that our region, the Indo-Pacific, is free, open, inclusive, and prosperous? And how can we guarantee a rules-based international order in which disputes are resolved peacefully, free from coercion, and in accordance with international law? First, how far? How far we have come? In order to consider this, we must look at where we started. Japan and Australia's relationship has long been defined by deep economic complementarity. The roots of this are older than Australia's federation. At the turn of the 19th to 20th century, a Japanese government delegation visited Australia identifying it as a promising trade partner. This potential had long been recognized by the private sector. Japanese trading houses had set up what would become a more than century-long presence in Australia. The delegation recommended the establishment of the first Japanese diplomatic mission in Australia. Exactly 125 years ago, this was realized in Townsville. Soon after, a regular shipping route commenced between Yokohama and Sydney. Six decades later, these trade relations were given a strong framework through Japan's accession to the GATT and our commerce agreement. Japan then became Australia's largest trading partner, a position it held for 40 years. Without even having seen the film Japanese Story or read Patrick White's Boss, Japanese people developed a fascination with the vastness and the beauty of the Aussie landscape, driving unprecedented growth in the tourism industry. And a cycle of Japanese investment 
and reinvestment gained traction, creating jobs and boosting economic growth. Australian exporters also made significant headways. All the cheese, beef, and sugar capture the largest share of the Japanese market. Today, their market share have reached 23, 45, and 82%, respectively. Really impressive. Resources exports to Japan also boomed when visiting resource-rich Queensland and Western Australia. I was humbled, really humbled, by the generous words of people there. Without Japan, they said, Australia would not enjoy the prosperity it does today. No other country in Australia's history has been so involved in every stage of the supply chain. Finding, digging, and shipping the resources that have helped regional communities to flourish. What I would like to add here is that it has gone both ways. Without the su stable supply of resources, the Japanese economy would not have grown this big or this mature. But the greatest benefit of our economic complementarity has not shown on balance sheets. It has been the increased engagement between our business communities, not for short-term profit, but as a dedicated long-term commitment. This became a seed of mutual trust, which grew into the roots that anchor our relationship. The people of our nations came to understand what we had in common. They understood that we share faith in the free market economy, that we value democracy and human rights, and above all, we uphold the rule of law. What is most astonishing, however, is how our relationship has deepened and broadened over the past 15 years. We are no longer defined solely by trade and investment. I have mentioned our shared values. But our relationship today is also underpinned by our shared strategic interests. In 2007, our prime ministers signed joint declaration on security cooperation. In this same year, our foreign ministers and defense ministers came together for the first two plus two consultations. We also agreed to boost the manufacturing and distribution of up to one billion doses of vaccines in the Indo-Pacific. This is not to say that our economic relationship waned on the sidelines. In 2014, Prime Minister Abe declined in the Australian Parliament that having deepened our economic ties, we would now join up in a scrap, just like rugby, to nurture a regional and world order and to safeguard peace. And that is exactly what we have been doing. We elevated our relationship to a special strategic partnership. We created momentum for the quote, culminating in the historic first ever leaders meeting in March of this year. There, Japan and Australia, along with the United States and India, agree to support principles such as the rule of law, freedom of navigation and overflight, peaceful settlement of disputes, democratic values, and territorial integrity. I talked about the vaccine uh, before, so I will let me continue about the economic relationship because over the past 15 years, trade between Australia and Japan has increased by around 60, 60%. This was spurred on by the conclusion of our landmark economic partnership agreement in 2015. Australian coal, the first traded commodity to Japan back in 1865, today makes up 
over half of all Japanese coal imports. For Australia, that is over a quarter of all coal exports. For all the LNG, the proportion that goes to Japan is even higher at around 40%. Likewise, after a century-long export history to Japan, Australia iron ore continues to be essential to the Japanese economy. Over half of all Japan's imports of the mineral originate right here, right here in Australia. Investment has grown even further. Over the past 15 years, it has increased sixfold. Today, Japan is Australia's second largest investor. The total stock value of this invest investment has reached $132 billion. Significantly, Japanese companies have continued to reinvest earnings from their Australian businesses, contributing to well over 70,000 jobs. In the field, once again, film. Muriel's wedding. The bungling businessman, Bill Heslop, he just struggled to tell the difference between Japan and its neighbors. Those days are long gone. The economic boost has been two-way. Australian tourists have become a significant asset for Japan's tourism industry. Did you know that Aussies are the biggest spenders in Japan with an average of $3,000 per trip? $3,000 per trip. At 13 days, their average stay is one of the longest. This has led to an Australia investment, investment boom in such ski resorts as Niseko and Hakuba. A flight crew member once remarked to me that on every plane out of Japan, at least one poor Aussie with broken limbs can be spotted. <laughs> Once borders open, those broken limbs can certainly return to Japan for a hot spring. <laughs> our, our commitment to the liberalization of trade and the rule of law also led us to work together to promote regional economic integration. We ensured, Australia and Japan ensured the entry into force of the CPTPP our two nations also became the driving force behind RCEP. In honor of the Aussie Spirit, Spirit Squad, I would like to update the rugby metaphor into a softball one. Japan and Australia now have all bases loaded, all bases loaded, ready for a Grand Slam home run. In the next 15 years, we can achieve prosperity and stability beyond that of the last. So why we celebrate our success story? We must also look ahead. Opportunities and challenges facing our nations leave no room for complacency. Where do we want to be 15 years from now? I would like to answer that question from three angles. Our economic partnership, climate partnership, and security, security partnership. Let's start where we began, with our economic partnership. How can we ensure our nations are economically resilient as we face growing difficulties? To answer this question, I'd like to focus on trade, infrastructure, and space. As the world's second largest, second largest advanced economy with over 126 million sophisticated consumers, the Japanese market is of course, of course competitive. But I have faith in the quality and competitiveness of the Australian goods and services and the sales efforts of Aussie businesses are up to the task. For wine, the time is ripe. 
The groundwork for an Australian wine boom in Japan has been laid by our EPA. As of April this year, all tariffs on bottled wine have been reduced to zero. I have nothing against a reasonably priced wine. What a diplomatic expression. <laughs> but the quality of the cheese and beef dominating the Japanese market needs to be paired with quality Aussie wine. I would love to see some of those top range labels at my local bottle hall. <laughs> Likewise, Japan is seeking opportunities to provide more of its unique technology and expertise to meet the needs of Australian businesses. One area of great potential is infrastructure. Japanese experience in this field particularly in high-speed rail, could dramatically revitalize the way of life in this country. I'm sure there are many journalists here today who frequently travel between Sydney and Canberra. With high-speed rail, journey, this journey could be shortened to an hour. And the Great Lake from Melbourne to Sydney to a meager three hours. For me, the Shinkansen has been a game changer. It allowed me to commute 150 kilometers through the mountains of Nagano to Tokyo for work. What used to be more than a three hour trip became just a single hour. Both Australia and Japan already have esteemed global reputations for livability, but we also face a challenge of rapidly developing cities. We all know that Greater Sydney area is one of the fast, fastest growing regions in the world. Already, Japanese companies are contributing to the transformation of this city. Half a dozen Japanese infrastructure players have signed agreements to partner with the state government on a range of initiatives and Japanese involvement in the reconstruction of the city's northwest has led to Australia's first fully automated rail network. Japan can also assist with Australia's goal of tripling the commercial space sector's contribution to GDP by 2030. Our space agency, JAXA, has led dozens of international space exploration missions. The most recent of these the Hayabusa 2 mission was carried out in cooperation with Australia. The asteroid samples collected may provide insights into the origins of the solar system and life on Earth. During the black summer bushfires, Japan's Himawari 8 satellite enabled Australia to use near real-time imagery to detect to detect bushfire hotspots. Australia's Optus C1, the world's largest hybrid commercial and military satellite, also utilizes Japanese technology to provide communication services to remote areas of this country. When I visited the Australia Space Agency in Adelaide, I was lucky enough to be given this limited edition Koala Nord. For those of you who haven't seen one, uh, this is a dollar ball, soft toy koala dressed as an astronaut. <laughs> so maybe one of these days, with advances and with cooperation between Australia and Japan, eucalypt will germinate on the moon. <laughs> Otherwise, they are going to get very hungry up there. <laughs> Of course, our economic prosperity is contingent on the preservation of a rules-based international order. Here again, what we do together matters. Our cooperation can help to keep this most vital framework intact. Over the next 15 years, this will not be easy. To quote the words of Prime Minister Suga and Prime Minister Morrison. Trade should never be used as a tool to apply political pressure. 
trade should never be used as a tool to apply political pressure. These words endorse and embody Japan and Australia's determination to ensure our region is one, where disputes are resolved peacefully without coercion or the threat of force. Indeed, Australia is not walking alone. Let me repeat, Australia is not walking alone. Japan fully supports Australia's efforts to solve the ongoing trade disputes through dialogue in accordance with international laws. I applaud the way Australia has faced up to tremendous pressures in a consistent, principled, and resilient manner. Together, we must continue to pursue liberalization and the establishment of fair, transparent rules. We must work to expand the CPTPP. Currently, Australia and Japan are playing an active role to examine the accession of the United Kingdom. The accession working group is being chaired by Japan with Australia as vice chair. Successful implementation of RCEP will also require our joint efforts. And we can engage further at the OECD. The election of the Honorable Matthias Coleman to the Secretary General was warmly welcomed by Japan. Japan supports Australia's increased global role, which has significance in raising the profile of the Indo-Pacific region. Together with Deputy Secretary General, Japan's Kodo Masamichi, my good friend, we are confident Secretary General Koman will be a strong, positive force for multilateral cooperation. It is also incumbent upon us as staunch believers in the multilateral trading system to push for the reform of the WTO and its dispute settlement mechanism. Next, I will touch upon our climate partnership. Japan is not here to lecture, but to cooperate. When we look ahead to the future, it is natural that we think of climate change. In 15 years' time, how will our governments and industries be responding to one of the defining challenge, defining global challenges of our times? The answer can be found in the Japan-Australia partnership on decarbonization through technology, announced just last month. Our nations are committed to a technology-led response to climate change. We believe in the power of innovation. We see hydrogen as our future. Japan has high hopes for Australia's endeavor to become a world leader in hydrogen production and exports. By 2030, Japan aims to be using up to 3 million tons of hydrogen each year. Some of this will come from the hydrogen energy supply chain, HESC project, in Lateral Valley, Victoria. This world first pilot project is being led by a consortium of Japanese heavy hitters. Commercial operations are tipped to begin within two decades, with a 2050 goal of 20 million tons of annual hydrogen use Japan will be eager to receive hydrogen from a great number of sources. I am pleased to note that there are already dozens of Japan-supported clean energy projects underway all over Australia. Japan's private sector is just as keen to make our hydrogen, hydrogen future a reality. Currently, over 200 Japanese companies make up the Japan Hydrogen Association. Their aim? to promote the creation of a hydrogen supply chain. Many of these companies are backing hydrogen and ammonia projects right here in Australia. So now you know how serious corporate Japan is about hydrogen. Finally, on our strategic partnership, 
I have already emphasized the importance of the rules-based international order for our prosperity. This order must be backed up by our defense cooperation, and the key concept is deterrence. Deterrence. The geopolitical environment today cannot and should not be understood in a Cold War era binary terms. What we face, a challenge is posed by the rise of emerging powers. These affect the entire international community. Japan, Australia are frontline states, frontline states, which is why it is vital that we address them. Not alone, but with a special sense of responsibility and leadership in cooperation with the rest of the world. As outlined in our recent 2 plus 2 ministerial consultations between Foreign Minister Motegi, Payne, Defense Ministers Kishi and Dutton, we welcome the strong and enduring presence of the United States in the Indo-Pacific. We recognize the importance of cooperation with ASEAN and Pacific Island countries. And we welcome the increasing commitment of Europe. All of this growing interest in our region from the international community enhances, enhances deterrence. I am pleased to note that as I speak, Japan is participating in exercise Talisman Saber 21 which is now taking place in the Queensland and the Northern Territory. This truly impressive Australia-US exercise will involve 17,000 personnel. Forces from Canada, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, and the Republic of Korea will also participate directly. And I see my friend, German ambassador here. Delegations from Germany, France, Indo, India and Indonesia will also observe. As we move forward, the spearheading role that Japan and Australia have been playing in building defense ties will become more pronounced. Our bilateral cooperation will grow stronger. Almost 15 years since the signing of our joint declaration on security cooperation, countless joint exercises have been conducted between us. Today, our defense cooperation has reached a new stage, higher plateau. On a practical, operational level, it has evolved significantly. In September last year, the Royal Australian Navy and the Japanese Maritime Safe Defense Force undertook a joint transit in the South China Sea. In November, Prime Minister Morrison became the first foreign dignitary to meet in Japan with newly elected our Prime Minister Suga to discuss the reciprocal access agreement. Negotiations have now entered their final stage. The signing of the RAA will be a significant milestone for our defense cooperation and a clear indication of the importance Japan places on its partnership with Australia. Recently, we also announced the creation of the framework to allow the JSDF to protect ADF assets. This will further accelerate the sophistication of our joint activities. Our ambition to increase the complexity of bilateral exercise and operations beyond, between our defense forces, including through air-to-air -air refueling, will further enhance deterrence in our region. Now, I cannot leave here today without making reference to the importance of the East China Sea. I foresee that we will need to deepen communication and cooperation regarding this body of water. The situation there is by no means unrelated to Australia. For Australia's, for Australia's shipping industry, the country with the highest transaction values are all in Northeast Asia. As a five of the world's top 10 busiest ports, all of these ports connect to shipping routes which pass through the East China Sea. In this respect, this respect, the East China Sea is just as crucial for Australia's security and economic interest as the South. Both 
a, a lifeline for us. Any unilateral attempt to challenge the status quo by force or coercion in these seas will inevitably impact upon our prosperity. The importance of the peace and stability of the Taiwan Strait has also been shared by both our nations. It is my hope that the further deepening of our ties over the coming years will allow for unprecedented defense cooperation. Only together can we ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific where all nations, not only Australia and Japan, all nations can equally enjoy peace, prosperity, and stability under the rule of law. Today, I began this speech by touching on the ways I have seen Australia represented through film and literature. To me, Australia is a forward-looking, resilient nation. It is not simply lucky. It is talented. It is fair, down to earth. Indeed, I would say it is a global power. Though I know that here in Australia, like Japan, there is a tendency to undersell oneself. How we view ourselves is important, not only for Australia, but for Japan, Australia. Which is why I chose today to think in concrete terms about our relationship in the 15 years ahead. But we need not limit our vision to that specific time frame. Our mutual trust is our greatest asset. This trust continues to be strengthened by mutual respect and tolerance. With this as our foundation, we can continue to accomplish whatever we set out to do. Our dedication to peace, freedom, and democracy, our respect for the rule of law, these, along with our strategic interest ties our futures together. What we do together matters. It matters for our nations, our region, and the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, obviously, there is a great interest in strategic issues. Um, Japan and Australia uh, were amongst the signatories this week to a um, calling out of uh, Chinese uh, cyber intrusions, uh, which was pretty unprecedented. Uh, but I just wonder, in reflecting on the region, Japan has taken a different approach to China uh, over the last few years uh, to Australia, which, as you reflected, has a slightly difficult relationship with China now. Could you tell us a little bit about the way Japan approaches China and whether there are some lessons for Australia in that? Mm. Well, since, uh, uh, thank you, Lola, for your excellent question. And uh, I think uh, uh, I have received you know, a similar question from a number of you know, Aussie colleagues since my arrival here. You know, uh, the nutshell of that argument is Japan is doing far better than Australia when it comes to dealing with Japan's neighbor, China. My, my simple answer is no way. <laughs> I'm too diplomatic to use this you know, B-U-L-L word. <laughs> I don't use it here, but no way, no merit. And I don't subscribe, you know, I'm afraid I don't su subscribe to such an argument. Uh, why? Because each and every day, Japan is struggling. To us, we have this issue of national security. We have this issue of Senkaku as well. So, no, I will give you one example. We incorporated Senkaku Islands back in 1895. 
for more than three quarters of a century, they were silent. So for the first time in history, 1971, after 70 some years, they made their claim to those islands. But not only that, they started sending their ships to those Japanese islands. This is a blatant attempt to challenge the status quo in the East China Sea. So this is the kind of issue we are, you know, we are facing right now. That's why I said we, you know, Australia, Japan, United States, like-minded countries have to get together, join forces to address these challenges posed by the rise of this emerging power. So don't worry, you know, you are doing an excellent job. We are in the same boat and we should work together. That's my simple answer. Anthony Galloway. Uh, thank you for your excellent speech, Ambassador. Um, you said in your speech that Australia and Japan and other like-minded countries need to be looking at deterrence at the moment. I was wondering whether you can say whether the biggest need is deter to deter against traditional kinetic warfare or whether the biggest threat is the grey zone. Mm -hmm. And um, if it is the grey zone, how do we deter against that? Mm -hmm. Thank you for another excellent point. And uh, many strategists in Japan often talked about you know, this asymmetrical you know, warfare. So you know, rather than they worrying about you know, a possible nuclear confrontation, they do really worry about how come you know, disguised fishermen came on shore or you know, cyber attack takes place you know, all over the areas of our interest. That's a kind of constant you know, uh, concern on the part of my colleagues in the Japanese government. So I think you're quite right you know, on why keeping our you know, deterrence uh, working we have to make sure to prepare for uh, every kind of you know, scenario to, to take place. And that certainly requires a tremendous amount of efforts and resources. That's why I mentioned the importance of cooperation between Australia and Japan today. Ben Patton. Your Excellency, thank you for your speech. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion in Australia about the, um, the future of the Port of Darwin, um, which is currently um, leased on a 99-year arrangement <clears throat> um, with a Chinese company. Um, would Japan ever allow such a situation with one of its um, major strategic ports? And um, can you see any uh, difficulties going forward in um, uh, a greater Australia-Japan defence cooperation in the Northern Territory? Um, while uh, Landbridge retains uh, control of that port. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for your question. And uh, well, uh, personally, you know, I've been to Darwin twice. First time accompanying then Prime Minister uh, Abe, and second time as ambassador, uh, I did the official trip to the Northern Territory. And every time you know, I go there, uh, I, I just feel how close Australia is to Asia. Yes, of course, you, know, you can say Australia is a part of you know, Asia, Pacific, in the Pacific, but as far as Asians concerned, you know, you know, we feel Australia is very close to Asia whenever we go to Northern Territory. And that demonstrates the strategic significance of the Northern Territory as well as the port of Darwin. With that in mind, Japanese self-defense forces have been conducting a number of joint exercises, you know, including southern jackaroos you know, with Australian you know, counterparts or involving Americans as, as well. So you know, coming back to your question of could it happen to Japan, I cannot imagine the same to take place in ports like you know, Sasebo or Yokosuka. I can't imagine. But uh, you know, uh, it's a decision for Australian government to make. So as a Japanese ambassador to Australia, you know, I make it a rule not to poke my nose into domestic politics of both Australia and Japan. 
Andrew Tillett. Andrew Tillett from the Financial Review, Your Excellency. Good to see you again. Um, we've um, got a situation where in Papua New Guinea where uh, Japan, Australia and the US are uh, co-funding an electrification project in, uh, in PNG. We've obviously seen, um, we've been reporting this week about uh, the possibility of Telstra buying Digicel, a PNG mm -hmm. um, a telco provider. I was just wondering if you've got any thoughts about whether uh, Japan if there's a parallel with the uh, electrification program, pro program whether um, Japan would be interested in uh, co-investing mm -hmm. in Digicel or helping with uh, upgrading mm -hmm. PNG tele telecommunications networks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, already, though, with regard to your point, already there is a cooperation going on amongst you know, three countries, i.e. Australia and Japan and the United States, for example, in laying, you know, submarine cable uh, for countries, you know, island countries like, you know, Palau. So uh, on top of this, I'm quite sure there will be a number of, you know, possible projects to be undertaken by our, you know, our three countries. After all, you know, uh, Japan is subscribing this idea of free and open in the Pacific. And this idea involves making sure each nation in the region have access to quality, you know, quality infrastructure. And uh, with that in mind, I think there is a lot of room for us, you know, to do together. And on top of that, you know, we are, you know, joining forces to help those Pacific Island countries to deal with the COVID. So, you know, vaccination rolling out is one of those examples. So whether Pacific Island countries or Southeast Asian countries, I think there is a lot of room for us to even, you know, even strengthen our cooperation between Canberra and Tokyo, or sometimes you know, Washington DC included. Jane Norman. Hello, Ambassador. Thank you for your speech today. I'm Jane Norman from the ABC. Um, you were talking about strengthening defence cooperation mm -hmm. between Japan and Australia to reach an unprecedented level. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what you think about intelligence sharing. How open is Japan to perhaps joining the Five Eyes Intel network? And um, do you see any obstacles mm -hmm. to joining that uh, network? No. Thank you, Jane, for your, you know, another good question. And uh, well, I have my good friend Mike Burgess here today. So uh, he will, you know, listen to my answer with, you know, great interest. <laughs> uh, we don't spy each other. Uh, I, th no, I was the head of the intelligence arm of the Japanese Foreign Ministry several years ago. And I tell you my experience. Australia is one of the closest countries to Japan when it comes to intelligence cooperation. I do appreciate great, you know, close, kind cooperation we got from our friends in Australia. There is no question. So yes, no, I'm the one to go for even closer cooperation between Canberra and Tokyo. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, sounds a uh, great flattery to us. You know, Japan should join Five Eyes and so on. Uh, at the same time, you know, we are fully aware that, uh, you know, these members of the so-called Five Eyes share, you know, language, you know, not like me, they speak far better English, you know, and they share history together and, uh, you know, social system and so on. So how to make an interface between the Five Eyes and Japan, uh, I think requires a lot of you know, uh, considerations. And as far as Japan is concerned, there seems to be a number of homework to be done by us, including uh, you know, legal, uh, legal arrangement, as well as you know, organizational you know, architecture to be improved on Japan's part. So my, my immediate answer is rather than talking or rather than dwelling with the issue of the institution, there is a lot we can do together in terms of keep on building 
specific blocks of cooperation. And I think that is exactly you know, my colleagues in Tokyo are right now you know, doing with their OG counterparts or American, British, Canadian, you know, Kiwi counterparts. But thank you for your excellent question. Pablo Vinales. Your Excellency, Pablo Vinales, SBS World News. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, just on your comments on the East uh, China Sea, you said the situation there is by no means unrelated to Australia mm. and that the East China Sea is just as crucial for Australia's mm. uh, security as the South China Sea. Uh, given the situation is escalating there, is there now a sense of urgency? And what would you like to see Australia do when you say you want to see ties deepen in that regard? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, well, you know, uh, like I kept on emphasizing throughout my speech, uh, you know, we Japanese do not like lecturing or preaching to other. So it's up to Australia when it comes to, you know, pondering or considering what specific measures, you know, uh, could be taken. But uh, my point is, you know, I had an ish impression there seems to be a rather implicit line draw between the East China Sea and South China Sea as if this line is a dividing one between fear of abandonment and fear of entanglement. So you know, Australia being a responsible, very influential member in the Indo-Pacific, I just wanted to highlight the importance of peace and stability of the East China Sea to the entire interest of Australia or entire you know, region's peace and stability. It's not to say you know, we are not doing anything at all in the East China Sea. Already we are jointly you know, cooperating uh, in terms of implementing UN Security Council resolutions in preventing so-called ship-to-ship transfer uh, in helping or, you know, North Korea's nuclear and missile development. That is one great progress we are making there. Uh, but on top of that, maybe we can consider you know, joint exercise, you know, like Arc 21 we did before, just a few weeks ago, or you know, joint trees exercise, or intelligence gathering. You know. uh, these are sort of stuff uh, I can just you know, think of. So, you know, uh, our horizon of cooperation is expanding day by day. Lani Scar. Lani Scar from the West Australian. Thanks so much for your speech, Ambassador. You spoke about the importance of the resources sector to the Australian and Japanese economies. 40% of Japan's LNG comes from Australia. 60% mm. of iron ore imports come from Australia. We know critical minerals and hydrogen mm. will be central to the energy revolution over the next decade. Do you see a situation where Australia could become the main supplier of both of those um, resources? Mm. And if not Australia, then who is our biggest competition that mm. we need to do better then? Thank you for asking that question because that's a point you know uh, I forgot to mention uh, Japan's lesson. Uh, about ten years ago, Japan had to go through similar experience what Australia is experiencing right now. Our rare earth mineral imports uh, were severely you know, restrict, restricted because of this uh, political issue of Senkaku Islands. So what we did at that time was twofold. First, we brought the case to WTO to solve the disputes in accordance with international rules. Second, we did our best trying to reduce the dependency on this you know, uh, particular source, i.e. China. So with the assistance and cooperation of Australian company named Linus, we could reduce the dependency on Chinese sources from 85% to 63%. That is, in other ways, you know, we call it China plus one strategy. We need to diversify risks. We need to find alternative markets or alternative sources of our, you know, uh, materials of vital importance to us. So in that regard, 
whether rare earth mineral or LNG or coal, Australia continues to be an important source of those materials to Japan. And another important thing I want to you know, emphasize here is we count on Australia because we don't, we don't have solid bedrock of mutual trust. I talked about you know, not short-term profit, long-term, dedicated long long-term commitment, I think which makes the backbone of our economic or nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Daniel Hurst. Daniel Hurst from Guardian Australia. Ambassador Yamagami, thanks for your talk. Um, uh, my question's about climate. I know you said you weren't in the business of lecturing, but uh, talking about corporations, mm. so I'll word this carefully. Prime Minister Suga has committed to net zero by 2050. Would it be positive in Japan's view? Would it be good for cooperation if Australia made a similar firm commitment to net zero by 2050? Mm -hmm. And secondly, the Economy and Trade Minister, Ministry, METI, in February began studying carbon border adjustment mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, what assessment are you sharing with Australia about the likelihood of Japan going mm -hmm. down that path of carbon border tariffs like the EU has done? Another of my favorite movie is Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> Just as I thought I was out, <laughs> they put me back in. <laughs> so you are trying to make me comment on Australian domestic politics. I won't. International climate. That said, that, yeah, that said Australia and Japan share our ideas that you know, it's up to us to reach the final goal. You know, we have our own unique social economic system, each other. So it's up to you know, you know, each member of the international community. But in that process, you know, we can help each other. That's why I talked about the importance of innovation, importance of developing hydrogen production and exports between Japan and Australia. For example, this project. You know, HESC project is quite something. I went to see this one in Lateral Valley and you know, uh, Hastings Port, and they cool down the hydrogen to the temperature of minus 253 degrees. So this kind of advanced you know, technology combined with long-term economic relationship, you know, backed up by mutual trust, I think this is a historic endeavor. We are jointly conducting together between Australia and Japan. So in so doing, you know, hopefully we can reach this final goal of carbon free. And a carbon border tariffs likely to be introduced by Japan? Carbon tariffs, so well, uh, I think uh, it requires a careful, careful consideration, you know, in terms of, you know, WTO, you know, consistency or in terms of, you know, economic uh, efficiency. So when it comes to this kind of measure, we would like to seek for, you know, transparency on the part of countries which are trying to impose such measures. Simon Gross. Simon Groves, Canberra IQ. Uh, thank you for your speech. Ambassador, you managed to be both funny and forthright, so that was uh, much appreciated. Um, uh, my question is also about climate. Um, the International Energy Agency uh, recently um, assessed uh, Japan's pathway to uh, net zero by 2050 mm -hmm. and said it would be a unique pathway. Um, you're constrained in terms of offshore wind because of the nature of your uh, of the seascape un, um, around you, and um, it pointed out that your your nuclear power stations are mostly due to be decommissioned by 2050, and it uh, it uh, urged mm. uh, Japan to commission new nuclear power stations to fill a gap that it said if. Uh, that was not done. The uh, area of solar power installations would have to be 40 times the area of the, uh, the Tokyo Greater Metropolitan Area. Uh, what prospect do you see for Japan to 
uh, go back again and, and in, engage in the, like a whole new wave mm -hmm. of nuclear energy? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, like uh, you know, uh, any any you know responsible member of the international community, uh, Japan is fully aware of the importance of this issue, particularly when it comes to how to address you know uh, the reduction of carbon emissions and realizing carbon-free free society. And uh, uh, like I said. Uh, goals could be shared by you know many others, but at the same time, each country has its own unique you know situation, and it's up to what kind of you know energy you know mix you are going to adopt. So certainly, you know, the well, importance of renewable energy has been already highlighted in Japan too, and how to do with you know nuclear energy always you know a topic of constant uh, discussions. So rather than pointing a finger at any country, whether Australia and Japan, I think what's important to us is we should work together, especially you know. Like I said, you know, repeatedly, innovation is the key, and you know, countries like Australia and Japan can open a new frontier of cooperation. And also, you know, when it comes to climate change, of course, we can cooperate with you know any other member of the international community. But that said, you know, I think uh, uh, we would like to seek. You know, biggest emitters are you know behaving in a responsible manner as well. What about uh, nuclear energy for Japan in the future? Here, you know, I do not want to talk. You know, dwell on that issue because it's a constant. You know, a constant debate is going on. Anybody who have seen uh, the TV pictures of Fukushima will realize. Is, uh, you know, enormity of difficulties we are facing. So I should stop here. David Crow. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ambassador. Great speech. I uh, love the movie references. Uh, David Crow from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age. Uh, to change to a brighter subject, I thought, um, travel between Japan and Australia, something we remember fondly mm -hmm. and look forward to again one day in the future. Yes. What's your assessment at the moment of um, a willingness in Japan to open travel bubbles with other countries? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether travel is possible into and out of Japan at the moment. And what, how would you describe the current uh, talks in terms mm -hmm. of setting up a travel bubble yeah. with Australia, if that's possible? I think, uh, you know, David, we talked about a ski trip to Hakuba. And before I came here, the governor of Nagano, uh, my school classmate, he told me, he gave me one mission as Japanese ambassador to Australia. Bring more Aussie skiers to Hakuba. Mm -hmm. So I'm working hard. Uh, I cannot wait to see travel bubble formed you know, between Australia and Japan. And also I keep on hearing from many businesses inside this country you know, taking care of tourists from Japan. We cannot wait. You know, those voices are coming from places like you know, Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast. Uh, so, yes, we need to redouble our efforts. But that said, you know, in order to reach that goal, we have to, you know, we have to put our house in order. Especially, you know, compared with Australia, uh, the number of new cases, you know, are still, you know, higher in Japan. By international standard, it's, you could say, or it's, you know, relatively controlled compared with countries in many other regions, but it does not allow for any complacency and constant you know, vigilance is required. So hopefully as uh, rollout spreads, vaccinations gets promoted, uh, we will get this pandemic under complete control and reopen the travel bubble between Australia and Japan. So whether, you know, broken limbs or not, you know, you are always welcome to visit Japan. And actually, investment from Australia has been upgrading the quality of, you know, results in Japan. 
I'm a resident in Nagano, and I can feel that. So please do come back. Our final question is from Mark Kenny. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Mark Kenny from ANU and also the Press Club Board. Um, President Xi of China has made uh, China's amb ambitions about the reunification of China with Taiwan, the reabsorption of the Taiwanese island with the mainland, uh, uh, made that abundantly clear. I wonder if you believe the West should also be equally clear in its resolve in relation to that mm. question. The US has a policy of strategic ambiguity that can be read uh, sort of uh, differently depending on what side of the strait you're on. Um, and if I could just quickly ask a, a, a domestic question as well. Uh, Australia's obviously going through a fairly painful process at the moment of addressing uh, endemic sexism in its political class in Parliament and in, uh, and in government um, I, and in broader society. Uh, could you advise us whether Japan is having a similar debate mm. or whether uh, a similar process mm. perhaps uh, is underway in Japanese politics or perhaps should be underway in Japanese mm. politics? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think uh, as to you know our cooperating together, uh, you know there is no denying that uh, we all understand the importance of working together, and that's why I think cooperation not not only for example amongst you know, members of the court, but also cooperation uh, between us, as I mean you know countries like Australia, Japan and ASEAN countries or Pacific Island countries or European countries are developing you know, rapidly uh, in an unprecedented manner. And also both Australian government and Japanese government do welcome uh, the clear commitment on the part of you know, US Biden administration into the you know, Indo-Pacific region. So certainly uh, our message uh, has become you know, uh, much more, you know, clear. Uh, I don't think uh, there is strategic you know, um, ambiguity you know, in, the, in that regard compared with the you know, older, older times. One example is you know, this talisman sailor. I mentioned the name of countries because I thought the list is so impressive. Five Eyes countries, Japan, South Korea, Germany, France, India, Indonesia. No, this is really impressive. They are now sending a signal in terms of keeping peace and stability of the Indo-Pacific. So you know, uh, while being careful not to escalate the rhetoric, not to escalate the tensions, we ought to do our work of keeping and reinforcing uh, deterrence. As for your second question, I think uh, each country, you know, is always, you know, uh, is suffering or, uh, you know, uh, dealing with those sensitive and very, very, you know, difficult, uh, difficult issues. So now uh, I'm not here to tell you know, my Australian friends to do this or that. But uh, once again, when it comes to these social issues as well, I think we are in the same boat. Because after all, like I emphasized in my presentation today, we do share basic values. We do share basic values. Democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, market economy. I think this fact speaks for itself. So you know, I think uh, the difficulties felt by Australian people are fully understood by people in Japan. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Ambassador Yamagami.